Hello, this is Connor Holt with the One Week Only Podcast, and today I'm talking about movie theaters. Um, uh, especially after doing this podcast for so long, but also just personally speaking, I love going to movie theaters, I love seeing films on the big screen, and especially living in Los Angeles, there's so many great classic movie theaters. There's the whole Broadway downtown area with the Ace Hotel and the Million Dollar Theater and whatnot. So I was so excited to hear about this new documentary, uh, Going Attractions, The Definitive Story of the Movie Palace by April Wright. And this is actually a follow-up documentary to her uh, first documentary, Going Attractions, about drive-ins. So she's kind of, she is making a, a series now on entertainments of the past that are still here but have died down and are in danger of being lost. Uh, you can find the drive-in documentary online, and it's really terrific and interesting because those are very much... Uh, a lost culture now that there used to be 5,000 of them and now there's only a few hundred of them. But movie palaces, you know, are still around. They're still here in major cities, but a lot of them now are concert venues or music venues or they are just sitting there or they've been turned to churches or they're just sitting derelict on the kind of the downtown areas that are no longer major hubs. So that's always fascinating to walk past a movie marquee that is now a church or is just empty and you wonder what's inside. And uh, Going Attractions looks inside. She has so many great uh, interviews with historians and theater managers and uh, even Leonard Moulton's in the film as well. Then they go inside of these theaters and you can look at them and you can they do interviews inside the gigantic canopies and the ornate artwork on the walls. So if you're a movie theater fan and movie fan, you have to check out this new documentary, Going Attractions. So I was so happy to talk to April Wright about um, what drives her, what's what, why she's so passionate about these 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 forgotten treasures of entertainment, um, where she wants to go next, and what she thinks right now about the movie theater business because there's so much happening these days with the new announcement of the the possible end of the Paramount decrees, which means movie theaters could potentially. Uh, resume monopolies over theaters, which is very terrifying in many ways. Uh, also, the fact that Disney has bought the Fox Library, and does that mean we'll never be able to see these classic Fox films like Alien on the big screen ever again? Uh, so it's, it's a very tumultuous time in movie theaters. So uh, April Wright is one of the experts that uh, knows what she's talking about, and it was a great pleasure. So here's my interview with director April Wright about her documentary, Going Attractions. Uh, April, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to talking about movie palaces. <laughs> yes. Well, what's fascinating is though is your your first going attractions documentary is about drive-ins, and this new one is about uh, movie palaces. So, um, when you finished your first one, uh, did you always intend to make a follow-up documentary about movie theaters, or was that only after the fact? Um, no, I have a whole list of what I think are going attractions. Ah. That are cultural things that used to be something everybody did uh, that we're losing. So besides drive-ins and movie palaces, I would also put roller rinks on that list, bowling alleys, uh, mom and pop amusement parks. There used to be a ton of uh, independently run amusement parks before everything became Six Flags or Disney. So there's a whole list of things like that that, um, that there's not that many of them left anymore. So when when did you first get the idea then for this kind of idea of a, re, of a recurring theme? What was, what was your first inkling of, I need to record these going attractions on film somehow? What was the first instance that made you think of that? Well, um, it's interesting because my family's business was roller skating rink. So I grew up in a roller rink. But for me, it really was the drive-in uh, documentary that started the idea because I went to drive-in growing up with my family. And I went to movie palaces also. But the drive-ins, I thought to myself, you know, we still love cars. We still love movies. What happened? Mm. <laughs> and uh, and I would drive past. I, I, this is in Chicago area when I lived there. I would go out of my way sometimes to drive to the streets where there were just drive-ins sitting, abandoned, and wonder, you know, what they might have looked like in their heyday. Um, and because architecturally they were very interesting to me with the big screen towers and the cool marquees. And so you'd wonder how could this be allowed to get into such bad condition. Um, and when I started doing research, you know, there were over 5,000 drive-ins at their peak and there had been like a thousand um, 
uh, in around two, well, I don't know the exact date, late 90s, I think there was still mm. about 1,000 left. And when I started doing my research, which was around 2005, it was down to about 400. And today it's down to about 300. Yeah. So um, I thought I need to make the movie before they are all gone. <laughs> so that was sort of the one that started it. And then, of course, I knew Movie Palaces was sort of same topic, but from a different angle. I know it's fascinating yeah. because, like with with uh, drive-ins, they talk about how you know theaters didn't like the drive-ins, so you made that film first. But now you're going back. Hey, I still like I like both of them. You know, you can like both. You don't have to pick a side, sort of. Well, well and I guess the funny thing would be if I ever make one about multiplexes because uh. you know, a lot of them are going away too. But um, but yeah, I mean, most of the drive-ins and movie palaces, at least at this point, they're independently run theaters, so mm. they actually are impacted by a lot of the same. Um, issues and culturally they were impacted by a lot of the same issues too with technology and VHS and streaming and all these things that started you know in the 80s and have continued till now have affected both so they're they're in the same ball, same uh, you know ballpark <laughs> mm-hmm. no uh, I read that you you approach documentary filmmaking where you kind of get into the story you, and you find it from the inside. Um, was that the case with this one, too? How did you approach the topic of yeah. new palaces? Yeah, um, yeah. I, um, I give credit to another filmmaker. When I was starting my first documentary on the drive-in, he said to really get involved with that community, and then they will tell you what the film is really about and who should be in it. And uh, I, I do believe that, um, that that's the right way to tell documentaries, to get involved with the people who are closest to the subject. And so, um, yeah, I got involved with the Theater Historical Society, with the Art House Convergence, which is the group of uh, independent theater owners and operators. And, um, you know, those were some of the places, some of the groups that helped me to uh, understand, you know, how they feel about this topic. Yeah, I love that the film has so many different perspectives. You have, you know, local theater managers, you have projectionists, you even have Leonard Malton in there. How was it uh, getting them all on camera, and were they all excited to be part of it? Yes, um, that part was actually great. Um, Leonard Malton came on pretty early. I knew he was a film critic, but I saw him speaking one time, and I realized he really did know the history of, um, of cinema and really about these buildings, too. So he was absolutely the right person. And then after that, you kind of map, you know, once you kind of know what your subjects are, you map it out, and then you kind of figure out who can best speak on each of these topics. And so then I try to, you know, round out and have diverse perspectives and somebody that can sort of be an expert in at least one area. And, uh, and I really, people have been really complimentary about the people in the film and the mix of people in the film and all the different points of view mm. and how it all weaves together. Um, so, and, and I agree. I think we got really great people in the film. And you also have so much archival materials. You have songs, you have photos, you have even some clips of films. Uh, how is that process of finding all that material? It's tough. <laughs> it's one <laughs> of the hardest parts of making a, a historic documentary is trying to find uh everything to show what is being talked about in the film. So some of the archival footage uh, photographs came through the Theater Historical Society. They maintain a big photographic archive. So having their support and having access to that archive was extremely helpful. But then I also do a lot of searching on my own to try to find the video because they only keep photos, not video. And... um, then you go through a process of figuring out what you have to license or what you can clear through fair use. And that's a whole uh, job in and of itself to go through that process and quite lengthy. But, um, but yeah, you, you have to show what people are talking about. Otherwise, people can't, you know, picture it. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, especially even in like a, your in your drive-in documentary, you have so many great songs about drive-ins. I, I never knew... <laughs> There were so many songs written about the drive-in theater. (laughs) Well, actually, for that one, for both of these films, I had a lot of original music made. Ah, okay. So, so yeah, in the drive-in one, there was a couple songs I licensed, but I had people um, record new songs. 
and um, yeah, so there's um, a lot of original music in the drive-in one, and for the Movie Palace one, I had a friend named Chris Wormer um, compose the score, and I wanted it to be epic, like like uh, <laughs> you know, like seeing a movie, like seeing a movie at a place like this should feel. And he's been um, he went to Berkeley Music School. And he's been playing for over 20 years, playing guitar with the Charlie Daniels band. And uh, once I started showing him this, this movie, I remembered his one of his favorite movies of all time was Cinema Paradiso. So I knew that he mm. understood what the film was about. But then when he started looking at it, he realized that for years, a lot of the venues where they've been playing were built as movie theaters, and he had no idea. And I think most people have no idea when they, you know, go to a concert or a touring Broadway show, you know, if it's got the name Paramount, Fox, or Warner, it was a movie palace when it was built. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing about where we are today is the idea that, um, sadly, a lot of these theaters are gone, but a lot of them, other ones, have become other things. So they're still around, they just may not be a movie theater. Like, how do you feel about that, where at least they're still around, at least they're still here physically, but they're not playing movies anymore yeah um people talk about that quite a bit in the film that these movie palaces had seating up to you know almost six thousand. if you look at a place like radio city music hall that you also might not realize was primarily a movie theater (laughs) um when you go to places like that yeah what kind of film is going to draw crowds of that size in those early days of cinema, in especially like when talkies happened um, in 1927, they could fill those seats all day long and all night long, um, which shows you how important the movies were to people um, even that long ago. Today, there's all streaming and all these options. So to have a movie that would fill a place with that capacity, it's not going to happen very often. Um, so for them to become... Uh, you know, places that do touring Broadway or have concerts really is the way for them to survive today. So I can't be against that, but I like places that also show movies every once in a while and sort of pay homage to that history in the mix of of their programming, I think is always pretty cool. But um, even the neighborhood movie houses, you know, most of them, I would say 700 to 1,000 is pretty average feeding. So, um, they're large. Yeah. Now, uh, big news right now with movie theaters is this announcement about the possible end of the Paramount decrees. Um, yep. Which is a fascinating thing because on the one hand, you know, the, the you know, th- studios owning the theaters was a monopoly. It, it was very dangerous at the time. And it could, could it, like, we could go back to that. But on the other hand, as you, as you point out in the film, the studios built these theaters a lot of times. So these gigantic theaters are thanks to studio money. So how do you feel about this new development with theater owning? Yeah, everybody's talking about it. Um, it is really interesting. And on one hand, it has the potential to close out a lot of these independent places like drive-ins and um, and all these art house theaters from product. Yeah. Because if studios have their own theaters and they're putting their product into their own theaters, uh, it's going to change the whole model for what type of content. Now, the other thing that's also happening is you have a lot of people have been talking about, you know, Disney bought Fox and one of the first things they did was shut down that library. Which mm-hmm. is a lot of con- a lot of content that some of these places play is uh, library content and retro films and classic films, and so if you have studios able to control and limit product that independent ex- ex- exhibitors have access to, that's why they're concerned that this could be a really bad thing. Um, you know, whereas today it's wide open and everybody can get the same product if, you know, they want to program them. So, uh, I don't know. You also have things like, you know, Netflix has the Egyptian theater in LA. Uh They're playing the the Irishman there nonstop right now. Um, But look at, you know, the the film they have out now, like the Irishman, like Roma last year, um, like 
um, marriage story. Mm -hmm. And they're putting all these into theaters themselves, plus other exhibitors are showing them as well. But films like that wouldn't be made by the studio system today Mm -hmm. uh, because they're mostly making bigger budget things. So you have somebody who has money, like a lot of these streaming services, that are able to make more artistic and more filmmaker driven product um, and then they're they're you know having venues to make sure that that product gets out theatrically the way that those filmmakers want it to be seen that's positive so I don't I don't know the answer but it certainly is going to change things mm-hmm. do you think uh, do you feel streaming is a positive thing overall? The fact that some of them, you know, on the one hand, yes, The Irishman is in theaters, but a lot of their other ones aren't getting theatrical releases. Is that, do you think it's more the blame on Netflix or other streaming, or is that more on the theaters not wanting to play them? Well, I think, I mean, somebody asked me this question yesterday and, uh, you know, how, how are streaming services driving what's being made by the studios? And I said, I, I don't think it's going that direction. I think the uh, studios never thought the streaming services would become studios mm. and start making and financing films. I think they saw it as an exhibition outlet that was going to replace physical DVD. So they saw it as a distribution outlet. When they got enough money to start creating original content, and the studios years ago had kind of stopped making you know, low to medium budget um films, you know, they used to have, you know, Fox had Fox Searchlight, Sony had Sony Classics, they had divisions where they were still making these films, and now the studio slate of films has become so much smaller, they moved away from, you know, they still make some, but um, they left a gap, and now you have these other streaming services that are financing, um, you know, potentially award-worthy films. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I don't know. I think I think most of the filmmakers I talk to see it as a good thing because there's a lot of um, need for material, and so that that is good. Um, but yeah, from an exhibition standpoint, I don't know. There's been a lot of articles about Scorsese's opinion on how how you should see films and what what is a real film and all this stuff. So all this stuff is very current. Um, I don't know the answers. I'm just I'm just observing like everybody else. <laughs> mm-hmm. But but I think my film absolutely. If people are interested in these topics, and specifically if they see my movie Palace documentary, it lays out everything for you, the whole history of exhibition, and will help you really understand what's going on now and the impact it could have. Yeah, no, with those independent theaters, that ones that, that want to show things like Alien, like these Fox titles, are they already feeling the pressure that they're gonna, they're losing these titles and they're going to lose revenue because of that? Oh, yeah, it's already happened. Um, a lot of uh, exhibitors I've talked to where they've had plans to play something that they've always been able to play. And I've seen a couple cases where they're like, okay, we'll allow it, it once or whatever. Mm-hmm. But a lot have had cancellations already, so... Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the, I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Nobody knows exactly how it's going to unfold, but I can tell you that there's a lot of, um, you know, committees and groups within the National Association of Theater Owners that are literally, you know, going to Washington to fight this. So hmm. um, there are concerns. Well, that's good. Um, back to the film, though. I got one thing. I, one of the beauties of the film is these incredible movie palaces, getting to go inside them, because some of them are closed or some of them are, are, you know, yeah. are only for music, so it's wonderful to get inside them and, and see them in their glory. How was yeah. that? How, do you have any favorite <laughs> memories of going to these theaters? Well, on that topic, yeah, I, I, I knew in this film that I wanted each of the interviews to be in a different movie palace, and that was actually one of the challenges, was not only having to... Um, deal with the person's scheduling, but then also to schedule how to get into these places if they aren't normally open. Um, so, so yeah, that was one of the fun and interesting parts to get to shoot in some of these places. Um, Radio City Music Hall is a funny one because I had only seen it previously on tours when it was empty, and then a couple weeks ago I went and saw the Christmas Spectacular there. 
and um, it was really crazy to see it not empty, <laughs> to see it with all the all the crowds yeah. in there. Um, and a couple of the ones that I have in in the film that are awaiting restoration, like the Avalon Regal on the south side of Chicago and the Uptown, um, you know, I've been in those empty, and it'll be really cool once they're restored to go see a show or a movie or a concert or whatever there. Um, because it just, I, I, what I usually say is that it really creates a memory. You know, if you are streaming something on your phone, you don't remember what you saw yesterday or last week or when it was. It all blurs together. But if you go see something in a place like this, in a, in a historic movie palace, whether it's a concert, a stage show, a film, some other performance, it really creates a memory. And that communal community experience of, of uh, shared entertainment, which you know is something humans have always had since the beginning of time, um, you know, it, it does something to our brains and it implants a memory that streaming doesn't do. Hmm. Do you feel like, it seems to me there's a lot of documentaries, like, like your ones and other films that are talking about, you know, things that have gone or things that are leaving. There's a certain, is there a certain nostalgia for things lost? Do you feel it's a, a new thing or it gets bigger now or does it just ebb and flow as from year to year, do you feel? Yeah, that's a good question. Nobody's asked me that before. <laughs> um, I think two things. One is um, aging baby boomers mm -hmm. um, because they're a huge audience and, um, you know, a lot of the things that people are nostalgic for, whether it's just, you know, beautiful mid-century homes or, uh, you know, roller rinks or whatever these things are, a lot of them really did reach their heyday with that population boom that happened um, after World War II. And so there's a lot of nostalgia from that period um, that I think people are, are really interested in. And that sort of extends into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and people loving all those time periods. So that's part of it. But also, I think a lot of the younger um, kids now seem to have more appreciation for uh, reuse and preservation and so I have seen in my screenings a lot of really young people um, who have said things like, you know, your film made me nostalgic for something I didn't experience. Mm. And now I feel like I'm missing it and I need to go find these places and have these experiences. So um, I, I do see that, that people are maybe a bit more conscious of uh, preservation and, and uh Use, you know, reusing old things and not being such a disposable society. Um, so, you know, may, maybe that's part of it, too. Now, yeah, you, so you, you've been playing it across the country right now, and here in Los Angeles, you played at the Lamley Theaters, which, sadly, two of those theaters you played at, the Araya and the Music Hall, have just closed. So how is I it... Know. How is it to... <laughs> you're playing this thing film, you know, celebrating movie theaters, and yet, at the same time, they're still closing. <laughs> Yes, I know. Isn't that weird? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of our, we, we were a couple of the last films to screen at these, and I think the music hall is being turned into something else. Yeah, they're not, they're not and, being torn down. And, they're just like, they'll yeah, no longer be it, first run had, theaters. Yeah, yeah, and it had been there for 80-some years. I think the, the fine arts is going to be a private screen room, so that's not being torn down. But, but yeah, um, there's a lot of movie theaters being torn, you know, being closed or torn down, Um a few are mentioned in the film, like the Beekman in New York. The Paris just closed in New York, but now it's open again with Netflix. With Netflix, yeah. Wedding story there. Um, so, yeah, and there's a lot of drive-ins closing recently, too. A, a huge number. Um, they, in, in the Los Angeles area, the Mission Tiki announced that they sold it, and they were going to close next month in December, but now they have a small... Uh, stay of execution that they're supposed to be open through the following summer and the development won't start till after that. Um, but yeah, I think this is part of this whole bigger conversation that we were just having about how we see films and how we consume this content and what are all these factors that are going to, you know, <laughs> affect what happens next. We're, we're definitely in a time of change. And so, yeah, in, in a good or bad way, it, it does make my film pretty timely. Um, when you when you look in context, some of these things that are happening right now and what the history is. 
Well, yeah, I do love your 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 Facebook page. It's always posting about theaters opening or closing or whatnot. So it's always it's a really handy resource, especially these days. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's like new there's new articles every day. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's such an active topic that, yeah, yeah, there's always, like, things to post to, you know, think about or be aware of. And, you know, it, it does, there, it is a relationship with the people and the people who go to these places, too, because, you know, especially in the case of drive-ins and movie palaces, if they're showing films, you have to go to them. You have to support them and, um, and be part of that audience that keeps them alive and thriving. And so, you know... If we like these places and we want to go to them, we have to we have to make it part of our every week routine. And uh, I don't know if people will do that. <laughs> Hopefully, they will. Hopefully, I do. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you have a you have a new short documentary called Julio's Dream. Um, what else do you have lined up right now? Are you are you going to do a well, film about roller yeah. rinks? That one, Julio's Dream. Actually, that um, it just played at the Arrow in Santa Monica, part of a shorts program. It's about the Griffith Park Carousel. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful story about Julio, who started working there when he was 16, and the, he didn't really have his father around in his life, and, and the man who owned um, the carousel kind of became his father figure, and 30 years later, when he passed away, he left the, car- the carousel to Julio. So Julio owns this piece of history, which is, you know, just a cool little story, um, but from my perspective, also, it's sort of a piece of a bigger story because you could do a whole documentary on carousels. Huh? <laughs> but, but for me, but for me, I think they're part of this older amusement um, documentary that I have in my head that I would like to make as another going attraction about independent amusements because carousels kind of predated um, other rides. Uh, there mm. were carousels in parks and on piers, you know, in the 1800s. So they were one of the first sort of ride um, that was all over the place. <laughs> so that was the, that's the idea of that one. Um, and but then when I met Julio, I'm like, oh, you're you're your own little story here. So let's just make this for now. <laughs> um, and then I also did a um, I already shot a documentary on stunt women, Hollywood stunt women. Mm. So um, you know they're not a going attraction. They're actually uh, I think the opportunities for them are are opening up with all those types of films being made now. But they are Hollywood history. So similar to drive-ins and movie palaces where I'm examining 100 years of the history of cinema, um, the Set Women documentary is similar in that way, that we look, we go back to the very beginning of movies uh, when women were doing stunts in, in early silent films and then bring it all the way up through the present day. And um, hopefully that one will be out sometime next year. And people can see that then. <laughs> well, that's great. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, so, April. It's been really great talking with you about uh, going attractions. Yeah, I appreciate it. And you've asked me some really, you know, thoughtful questions. So, um, thanks for putting me on the spot with some of those. <laughs> let me let me think about what I've been seeing and hearing about these things because, yeah, it is very timely. So, that was my interview with director April Wright about her documentary, Going Attractions, the definitive story of the movie Palace. Uh, It played here in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, and now it's playing kind of city by city across the country. So, definitely follow their Facebook page. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the Facebook page is posting every single day about where the movie's playing, but also where a theater is closing or a theater is in danger and needs your support or an article about how a theater is staying alive. It's a really amazing resource. So go to the Going Tractions documentary page on Facebook. It's a great resource to stay up to date on what's happening with classic movie theaters. Uh, but definitely it's one of my, there's so many documentaries these days about uh, theaters and film culture and they're all worth seeing. But right now this one is in theaters and needs your support. That's all I have for this episode of uh, One Week Only. As always, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Give us a like or a share or retweet. We'd love to hear from you. If you go see this movie, let us know what you think. Or if you have a favorite classic movie palace in your town, let us know. But until next time, I'm Connor. Thank you for listening.